Welcome. I'm going to go ahead and get started so that we have a chance to hear from all of our panelists. Um, I believe participants are still joining. Um, so if, if you've just arrived, welcome. This is uh, Beyond the Pandemic, Building a Just Recovery for the Arts, the second in the Labor Studies webinar series, Just Recovery, Labor Organizing and the Future We Want. So I'd like to start by uh, respectfully acknowledging that the three campuses of Simon Fraser University reside on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, Katsi, Quiet, Kekwantlin, sorry, Kwantlen, Semiamu, and Suwassen people, as well as the Coquitlam peoples. As I mentioned at the beginning, this is a webinar series hosted by the Labor Studies Program at Simon Fraser University. My name is Kendra Strauss. I'm the Director of the Labor Studies Program and Associate Professor in the Labor Studies Program and the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Simon Fraser University. Today's webinar tackles questions around the precarity of creative workers, models for building collective power, creating programs to support workers in the arts, and how we must use this moment to address systemic inequities in the arts sector. I just wanted to mention briefly that the inspiration for this webinar came from research conducted by one of our uh, former graduate students in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at SFU, Connor Moore, uh, a working theatre designer in Vancouver. And uh, a report based on his research, Creative Precarity, Improving Working Conditions for Canadian Theatre Designers, is being published by the SFU uh, Morgan Center for Labor Research and will be available shortly on our website. So if you're interested in this issue, please do take a look. I just want to briefly mention um, some of the, the sort of structure and rules of engagement uh, for the webinar today. So attendees are automatically muted with cameras turned off and the chat is disabled. However, we very much welcome questions and we'll have time, um, hopefully at least 20 minutes for questions after our panelists have spoken. So please do ask questions. You can ask them through the Q&A function. Um, and although we may not be able to answer everyone's questions today, uh, our moderator will try and ensure that the panelists get to as many questions as we can. So we look forward uh, and welcome uh, engagement. This webinar is being re recorded and the recording will be posted on the Labor Studies website um, if you wish to share it, um, you know, after the fact. Uh, we will be sending out a short uh, survey just to get people's feedback on the webinar, uh, so we would very much value your feedback if you're willing to give it. And I just wanted to mention briefly uh, for accessibility purposes that the transcript function should be available in Zoom. Um, uh, so, you know, if you, sorry, not the transcript function, um, the function that allows you to see um, the text, you know, the, the text version as people are speaking. Um, so if you wish to enable that, um, you know, please do so in Zoom, it should be available. I just want to briefly introduce today's moderator. Um, we're, we're very lucky to have uh, Marianne Bachelaporte, who is currently completing a PhD in SFU School of Communication. Um, we uh, are lucky to have Marianne moderating today's panel. Uh, she obtained her M MFA in Interdisciplinary Arts in 2012 from SFU and has exhibited artistic and curatorial projects across Canada, as well as being an expert on Canadian cultural policy and artist-run organizations. I'm going to pass over to Marianne now to introduce our panelists. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Kendra. Um, it's a real pleasure for me to be moderating this panel today. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me and for putting on such an interesting event. I very much look forward to hearing from our three panelists. Um, I will just mention before we start that uh, you can enter your questions uh, into the uh, Q&A function uh, at the bottom of your, uh, of your screen at any time uh, during the, the presenters uh, panels and we will uh, address these questions uh, towards the end. 
So without further ado, let me introduce the panelists. Maiko Yamamoto is a Vancouver-based artist who creates new experimental and intercultural works of performance. Since 20, 2003, Maiko has been co-artistic director of the Vancouver-based performance company Theatre Replacement. K. Don Douglas is the executive director of BIPOC TV and Film, a Toronto-based organization advocating for increased representation of screen media professionals from Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities. K. Don has also worked in documentary as a production coordinator, researcher, and digital marketing specialist. Johnny Sapochuk is a visual artist, curator, and community organizer. He is the lead organizer for IATSE Local 891 and president of the Arts and Cultural Workers Union, IATSE Local B778, as well as a founding member of the Vancouver Artists Labor Union Cooperative. And to start us off, I will hand the mic over to Maiko. I was muted. Thanks, Marianne. Uh, thanks everyone for being here. Uh, thanks to Kendra and the organizers and the Labor Studies Program uh, for the opportunity to be a part of this conversation today. Uh, so as a prompt for this panel discussion, Kendra sent us three questions. They were really big questions uh, that are very difficult to answer simply, especially from the overwhelming position of being inside of this moment right now. Of course, during this time, these questions have been rolling around our brains and our bodies as artists and cultural workers. The pandemic has further revealed to us things we have known for a long time. As artists, the precarity of what we do, questioning the value of what we do and what we provide society is not new. This moment is an opportunity to engage in a conversation that we as a city, as a society, as a community, and as a Canadian slash North American culture need to have. To help, I reached out to some trusted colleagues who work in theater and was really energized to be in a conversation with them about these big questions. Their responses were both very practical as well as more philosophical and imaginative. And what is it that we as artists do if not to imagine realities and futures and to bring them to our audiences in the hopes of a public conversation or a shift or a change or an opening of some kind? So on to the first question. How has the pandemic made visible the precarity of creative workers and what do we need to do to create a just recovery for the arts? Big question. Most artists I know understand fundamentally how precarious the arts are as a career. This is not new. It's been part of the culture here for so long that I think many of us don't think to question it. Or if we do question it, we still participate in all the structures uh, that perpetuate the precarity because it's the way it's always been, change is long, it seems so immovable, or because we have been told we have to suffer, or because we are all too busy hustling and working to be able to give it any real time. And yes, this unfolding time has made it more visible and more true. And yes, it has afforded artists a little time, not a lot, but a little to think about it. Across my many conversations, the pandemic has reiter reiterated what one colleague called a chronic undervaluing of artistic production. Again, not new. But how is this illuminated by this moment? And what does this actually mean to artists and their lives? It means that many artists, even after years of working with well-established careers, woke up last March to realize they are fundamentally operating inside of a gig economy. It means their outside jobs that they've had to hold down in order to pay rent, feed their families, live, have now become their main jobs, or they've had to leave the arts entirely to fall back on another skill set. It means they don't have healthcare, healthcare benefits or retirement plans. They didn't have these before the pandemic either, but it's felt more acutely now, I'm sure. And if they stay in the arts, they will likely have to continue to work for as long as their bodies and minds will allow. And then what happens after that? If they're young, they might not make it because this time has made them have a really hard think about whether it's possible or responsible for them to pursue a career in the arts if they are thinking about having a family one day or a house or any kind of stable existence. We've lost a lot of artists during this time. We are told by the structures, by the institutions, by the funders that we are valued. We are asked to bring meaning to times like these, to help make sense of the things we are trying to process or to understand. 
we are asked to be translators and to do the cultural work needed on social and systemic issues. And we are told that a culture that has art and artists is a sign of a healthy and a thriving culture. And yet we chronically undervalue artists and what they do. Almost everyone I spoke to talked about the idea of a universal basic income for artists. One colleague said, the whole Serb thing was shocking because all of a sudden artists were getting some kind of stable, meaningful income, income, which totally brought to light the kind of BS we often had to do to even do anything. Someone else called for a reassessment of where art is in the machine of our society. If it's located in luxury, then of course it will, it will return to how it was. But if it's weighted in public health, philosophically, not departmentally, for example, it may see itself integrating more into life which is perhaps a nice segue into the next question. What models can we look to for building collective power and creating programs to support workers in the arts? I'll answer this question with a question. If we truly recognize and acknowledge the value, um, if we truly uh, recognize and acknowledge and value the role that artists play in our society, then how can we better embed artists inside of the structures and systems in which we operate? I wanna read a bit from an article written by Deborah Cullinan, who's the CEO of the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco. It was published on HowlRound Theater Commons. The article is called The Future Becoming, uh, and it was part of a series called Devising Our Future that asked artists to consider a future theater field where resources and power are shared equitably in all directions, contributing to a more just and sustainable world. So she says, at the time, as the world teetered on the edge of an abyss, people came to understand something that seems all too obvious and yet was not. They understood that imagination was essential. The only way to ensure a radical emergence from this dangerous and broken state was to assert that people and their communities are the best and most creative imaginaries and designers of their own futures. And it was time to fuel the collective imagination in order to give shape to new institutions and structures that would deliver a new future possible. Imagine imagination as essential. Imagine if you couldn't imagine anything else but our current situation right now. Art and artists help us to imagine. And honestly, if we're going to recover, then we're gonna need some serious imagination power. Some of the brain trusts spoke dreamily about community-led models, about the idea of artists working and leading their own communities, which included audiences, as opposed to institutions leading artists, developing our own systems of accountability, as opposed to structures dictating how we should operate and account for ourselves. More independence means less having to say yes to unhealthy relationships and messed up power dynamics. And ultimately, again, they spoke about the need for shifting how art is valued by our society, the worth of artists, the worth of their work and what it contributes to all our collective lives. I want to swing back to Deborah's article to answer this question one more time, as well as perhaps offer a segue to the next question. So she says, others sought new models for centering artists, particularly, particularly those who had, been who had been historically marginalized, as critical facilitators who are working to advance equity and well-being in their communities. These models included artist-led community investment and participatory philanthropy, artists at the forefront of our healthcare system, and artist collectives and councils leading our cultural institutions. The whole article is pretty great. It has some great offers. I would recommend it. So the next question, how can we use this moment to address systemic inequities and how creative work is valued, whose work is valued, and how colonialism, racism, sexism, transphobia, and other oppressions operate in the arts and creative sectors. Talking about the precarity of artists and creative workers is one thing, but if you wanna add systemic inequities to the equation, you can turn the precarity dial all the way up. I'm gonna swing full brain trust on this answer. If anything, as an ode to generating some collective imagination power. Take the time for discussions and acknowledge that not everyone is interested in participating in them fully. Some people will be new at it, so it will take time. Take the responsibility as artists to be propagandists again. Demonstrate the, real, the realities and ways of thinking. Invest time in futurist thinking. I tell young BIPOC artists in Vancouver to build it themselves, and they have the chance to do it now. Woe be the BIPOC artists in Canada that must interface with institutions exclusively to practice their art. 
I see BIPOC artists raging against the institutions to include them, and I think that's a good thing. But of course, there's the burnout associated with that. It's hard work, and I'm glad they're doing it, but they also end up not being able to make their work. We need funding and funding models that address the specific barriers that marginalized artists experience so that these artists have a chance of staying in careers in the arts. We need to demand and normalize budgets and pay all arts workers living wages, benefits, and provide for us such that we can have things like retirement funds. The root of it is to get a much larger swath of the arts sector on the same page about how capitalism, capitalism, white supremacy and colonialism all go hand in hand, compounding and scaffolding each other, and that keeping artists, especially marginalized artists in precarity serves to uphold those systems. And lastly, one of my closest and longtime colleagues, James Long, who I built my company with and who I've made art with for over 17 years said, be cautious about burdening the artists with the task of solving society's inequities coming out of this, because we will try and we will try because that is where the funding will be at. As much as we like to pretend we don't, and this is especially true of the freelance and by association, historically marginalized artists, we chase the money and will bend creativity to policy. What this leads to is intense community damaging competition. And history has shown that at the end of the day, the most established companies who know how to work the system continue to dominate. The artist is at their most impactful when they are liberated to find unique ways to reflect society's quandaries back to us, not when they are asked to repair them. Uh, I wanna thank Corbin Murdoch, Jiv Parisram, Remy Sue, Lily Robinson, and James Long for their labor and for their time. Thanks. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, lots to reflect on there and certainly lots of issues that have been ongoing or chronic to uh, repeat the words that you have used uh, around value and precarity of artists labor um, definitely have come to the fore uh, in, in different ways uh, during the pandemic so it'd be interesting to talk about that more in the uh, question period um, so next we'll have uh, Kay Dawn um, address the uh, the audience Hello, everyone. Um, so great to be joining you all today from Toronto. Um, thank you so much to the team at Simon Fraser University for extending this invitation. It's really great to connect with everybody on this sunny Friday afternoon. Um, I'm going to take us just back to last last March when the world when the world paused. Um, we saw that in that stillness, we hunkered down. We binged countless hours of TV and film. We made Zoom our new Hangout Center and we found new ways to connect with each other. Last year, while many of us were living in some fear of the unknown of what, we, what is going to happen, when, um, when and how this, this pandemic will end, what the impact would be, we also did something that was really, really really miraculous in terms of a return to self and a return to community. Community, solidarity, and equity are the three guiding principles for BIPOC TV and film, the organization which I represent, um, which we represent, oh, we, we represent thousands of Black, Indigenous, and people of color creatives working within Canada's TV and film industry. What we also saw in that stillness last year um, was a greater awareness of the things that bind us and the things that separate us. We saw the we saw the power of community, and we also saw the great inequalities and in, inequalities and injustices in our society. Our notions of normal um, and essential and justice were extremely challenged. In that time, we saw much beauty. Um, for some of us who had an opportunity to witness, we saw nature healing itself. Um, we started to see greater appreciation for our medical professionals, for our grocers, for those people who were often overlooked um, within our society. Now they were deemed as superheroes. Um, but what we also witnessed was much ugliness. We, what happened last year, because we were so still, we got a chance to really see the, see the inequities in our society, saw 
saw police saw police brutality for what it is. We saw state sanctioned murder, state sanctioned oppression for what it is as well. And then we also saw the alarming race and class disparities. Um, we had reached critical mass um, as a society as a whole, but also within my own sector, um, Canada's multi-billion dollar film and TV, um, film and TV industry. What we also knew that, what we also knew, we knew that our systems, our current systems don't work. Um, and that we were also operating in a very, very big state of dysfunction. We also knew that change was urgent and, and that we could no longer operate in the way that we, the way that we are, the way that we were. Um, last year, 2021, devastated the film and TV industry in the same way as it did many, many of our other sectors. Um, production stalled. Um, we saw people being very fearful about when they would be working again. And this is largely due to the precarious nature of our industry. Um, thousands were unsure of when or how they will start back again um, as we waited for news um, for as we waited for news for a vaccine, for um, back to work measures as well. Um, what we also saw last year, what came to the front was the really great gaps that we have in the film and TV industry in terms of the experiences of black indigenous and, and people of color as opposed to our white counterparts. Um, we saw that very clearly during last year um, we also saw that there, while there was an increase for ap an increased appetite for content, um, that we also saw that lots of people were asking for Canadian content from diverse storytellers. People wanted to see themselves reflected on screen, and there was a greater call for narrative sovereignty amongst our creators, for us to be the ones creating our stories, telling our stories our way. And we spoke loudly about that in this period of recovery that nothing be created for us without our, without our contributions. Um, we also saw that there was a need for radical change right now for our sector. Um, lots of us working within the film and TV industry, specifically in production, are members of the gig economy. We are working show to show, set to set. Um, lots of us without any type of job security without any types of job security. Um, this is even greater for BIPOC artists. In a, in a Toronto Star op-ed for National Canadian Film Day this year, Krista Dickinson, executive director of Telefilm Canada said, it's clear that now is the time to not only lay the groundwork to accelerate the recovery and renewal within Canada's film industry, but to build a better, more inclusive industry for the long term. I want to draw attention to the word inclusive there and something that was just brought to my attention again right before I came into this session. And we really need to question who is who is including who? Um, and what are they what are they included? Who is holding the power um, within our industry? Um, when I was approached to to participate in this in this webinar. I started to think about what is what is a just recovery? What does justice look like within our sector? What does it look like for people who have for, for decades been silenced, been erased from our industry, whose stories were being told without their input, who would who were constantly being pushed out and pushed to the side? What does justice look for us? What does equity look look for us when we've only been accessing a small percentage of the funding pie, when our stories are not being greenlit? What does that look like for our industry going forward? Um, within BIPOC TV and film, these are the questions that we have been asking, and these are the demands that we've been bringing to the table. Um, with a strong, um, what we've been repeating at every single meeting is that nothing for us without us. Um, what we are calling for, for a just recovery for our sectors is a redistribution of power and resources. We acknowledge that we acknowledge that we need significant change at the decision making decision making level at for broadcasters at the CRTC at our major funding bodies as well. 
we need to see ourselves reflected in those roles um, on the boards in executive leadership. We also need to see a redistribution, a radical redistribution of resources. And what we've seen over the past few years is, and what has been celebrated is parity. So for example, with Telefilm Canada, we see that we see in terms of the report, in terms of celebrating reaching parity in terms of the distribution of funds. But when we look closer, we see, okay, well, there's 50, there's 40% um, of funding is going towards members of underrepresented groups. But when we take a closer look at that, we see that that includes everybody but cisgendered white men. That's not what we're going for. That's not what a just recovery looks like. We need a radical redistribution of it. So for example, if, 90, if only 5% of funding has gone towards our groups, the corrective measure is 95% of funding to be, to be distributed amongst us. Um, we're also calling for we're also calling for policies to be put in place to ensure that we have um, decent work experience, ensure that we're able to cover childcare, that we're able to take care of our families as well. We're calling for pay equity, and that involves work, um, our advocacy work at the union levels to ensure that we are able to access opportunities for employment. We are able to access career advancement opportunities as well. Um, another thing that we're that we're calling for is a reassessment of Canadian content. What is Canadian content? Um, what the policing around that does for those of us who are coming from BIPOC communities. Um, we see that for at the CRTC level, Canadian content is determined by CAVCO points. And that just means that productions that are majority made by Canadian creators. Um, so that would be people with citizenship and permanent resident status. Um, what we see culturally is that when we talk about Canadian content, it's usually through a very white lens. And we really need to radically redefine what that is that we, that we demand to see ourselves on screen. Um, we're also asking for core, core funding for organizations serving BIPOC communities so that we're able to support our members um, in really significant ways. And we're able to do the work that's necessary to ensure that they have the opportunities and access that, that we deserve. Um, we're also calling for the same um, funding, funding commitments to BIPOC owned production companies so we can create um, so we could create at scale so that we could compete with our white peers and compete in the global market. Um, and then finally, we are, we are requesting um, for the just recovery of our sector that we do need to apply a race-based analysis to data collection in the screen sector. A lot of times what we're met with is that there is no data to support um, the anecdotal um, data that we are sharing. So that's one thing that we are pushing for as a community too. Um, so yes, that's what I would like to share with you today. Um, just like to close that in terms of a just recovery for the arts and culture sector that we currently have more questions and answers, but we will continue pushing and pressing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caden. Um, again, lots here to unpack. Uh, I might just comment on, uh, you know, the, the radical rethinking that your organization is asking for in relation to some fundamental like bedrock uh, Canadian cultural policies like Canadian content regulation, uh, which very much furthers the, um, the white uh, colonial uh, narrative that Canadian cultural policy has been founded upon. So uh, I would be quite interested in hearing more about, um, about that and, I, and, and the ongoing measures that would be taken towards that effect. So thank you for sharing those ideas. Um, and we'll go to uh, Johnny, uh, last but not least. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks very much. I just wanna um, uh, echo uh, all of the brilliant comment, comments by uh, Kaylon and Michael. Um, um, 
I, uh, my name is Johnny Sopchuk. I'm a, an artist, curator, and union organizer. I, I work and live in Vancouver, BC on the unceded uh, territories of the Coast Salish peoples, uh, the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Um, and I'm really thankful to be here on this panel. I'm thankful that this conversation is happening and, and um, we're, we're both reflecting on where we've come from and, and where um, and where we're we're going collectively in the arts. Um, so to to start, I, I I'm I'm going to talk a little bit about my practice and and how it's brought me to this uh, date. Um, before diving into that, I just want to um, uh, center my remarks to to um, acknowledge that you know we are we're we're focused on a, a pandemic recovery um, from the devastating impacts of COVID nineteen. Um, and the impact, sorry, I'm getting emotional. I've, I've lost some close, um, some really close friends uh, have lost a lot of family to this disease and, and, um, and, and um, this virus. And uh, I've, um, my family has also been impacted. My sister had a very, um, a very uh, tough case of, of COVID that, uh, she contracted in her work setting as as an RN, but I also want to acknowledge that we're not just living in one pandemic. We are are dealing with a poison drug supply. Um, the overdose numbers in British Columbia have had a disproportionate uh, impact on uh, on our communities, on arts communities, and and uh, marginalized communities. And we're also still living with a legacy of the HIV and AIDS. Uh, uh, pandemics that are have decimated the arts for um, for over 40, 40 years now, uh, and and it's and it's unacceptable. And I think um, COVID has really uh, shown a, and opened up the cracks in our system, uh, and how when when the world pulls together to solve um, an issue, um, we can we have that collective strength, and we do. Um, it, it comes down to priorities and whose lives are being impacted and lost. Um, so I'm I'm a visual artist uh, and curator. Uh, I moved out to Vancouver about 10 years ago to take a break from my community and labor organizing practice. Uh, I went to Emily Carr uh, and studied uh, visual arts um, in sculpture, ceramics, and and drawing and printmaking. So um, uh, I do really obsessive compulsive. Uh, personal work on on labor um, production um, and and um, and and look at issues of compulsion. Um, I quickly realized that to make a living on the arts and in Vancouver was was uh, very untenable. Um, apparently, drinking red wine and making ceramics was not sustainable in in uh, this um, city in a globalized economy and and. Um, we needed to uh, we needed to change our thinking on the arts. So I returned to my community organizing and labor organizing practice. So I've been working as a union organizer in healthcare um, and and uh, in community social services for about the past fifteen years. And and just this last year or last uh, two years, I, I've been really fortunate to move over to a full time organizing practice with. IATSE, which is an incredible union that is doing fantastic work to support uh, freelance artists, technicians um, uh, uh, in the film and theater industries, and now uh, the visual arts sector. Um, I'm going to focus my comments on the work we're doing within uh, the visual arts sector, but also acknowledging that it, it has been the theater sector that has been the hardest hit from this pandemic through closures um, and, and, and continued um, uh, public health orders uh, that do not allow theater to operate. So I just want to acknowledge all of um, the hardship our um, our comrades in in uh, the theater industry have had to continue to go through. Um, the visual arts, the pandemic has has impacted artists individually uh, and collectively, and impacted our arts institutions. And I'm afraid of what's coming. Um, when we start to look at um, a post-pandemic recovery. And I, and I hope the pandemic has opened up new ways of thinking um, and new ways of, of funding uh, the arts. So we um, launched about two years ago now, a new initiative in Vancouver 
um, uh, we formed an independent union, the Arts and Cultural Workers Union, and we wanted to start to address some of these issues um, that Kaylon and, and Meko so, so um, brilliantly framed. Um, around precarity, around, um, you know, this, this hustle for, uh, uh, for funding, uh, and also to tackle the exploitation and scarcity mindset that pervades, pervades our, our arts institutions and organizations and the power structures. Um, that that um, initiative was started by a group of visual artists here in Vancouver. Um, we started having conversations about forming an independent union we did that. We founded a union to, to work towards um, cooperative and collective goals uh, to deal with precarity and build community and, and start to tackle this uh, the, the isolation that um, independent artists and contractors have to go through. Um, I'll fast forward to the pandemic, uh, and this is when it, it, it really shifted our organizing. So we were about to launch. We launched the Arts and Cultural Workers Union. Um, and at the same time, we launched a worker co-op called Value Co-op, the Vancouver Artist Labor Union Cooperative, um, as a communal space where the artist workers owned the means of productions. Um, and we worked on collective projects together to generate income. Um, so uh, we launched uh, in Chinatown in a Benevolent Association building, a fantastic organization run by the Lim Sai Hor Kao Mok Benevolent Association, a Chinese laborers and workers organization that dates back to 1903 in Vancouver. Um, and we formed a partnership and, and built out a production studio where we do communal projects together to generate flexible and sustaining income for our members. So when I say we do projects together, we do projects like these where we create tote bags and do design um, and create materials for progressive organizations. Um, our cooperative has grown to over 30 members. We launched just before the pandemic uh, 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 hit. Um, and, and that has made us shift the way we organize at value, the way we do our production work, and the way we expand our organizing into the community. Um, at the same time, we launched the Arts and Cultural Workers Union. And we were really fortunate to be um, uh, to build a relationship and partnership with IATSE, a fantastic union that has incredible experience organizing freelance uh, gig artists and technicians in film and theater and, and, and now the arts. Um, and our relationship uh, and our partnership with uh, IATSE has allowed us to start to build out programs that, uh, that Michael was talking about, Ken was talking about in the visual arts sector. Um, and these include a portable benefits plan. These include um, uh, retirement savings uh, uh, plans and, and, uh, and pooled services. Uh, so uh, when we launched at the start of the pandemic, we began organizing in, in the artist run community um, in Vancouver. And I have to acknowledge one of our um, original members who joined our freelance uh, division who uh, whose work and research has inspired this panel, Connor Moore, who has been one of our um, most incredible activists who's been supporting uh, arts workers who are artists um, working in a number of artist run centers and galleries in Vancouver. Um, and so we have organized uh, 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 five ar independent arts organizations into the union. And we're, uh, we just uh, concluded our first round of collective bargaining um, with an artist uh, organization um, uh, and uh, have created our first collective agreement for a group of 10 arts workers. Um, and and uh, Connor has, has really led that process and helped those members uh, through it. And the exciting thing about uh, that collective agreement is we've seen that um, arts institutions, particularly during the pandemic have seen uh, in the visual arts sector have seen huge in, infusions of, of funding uh, and resources. And our first collective agreement, I'm, I'm really excited that our members um, uh, who are working at that center uh, have, um, have uh, uh, received their first, for some of them, their first living wage. And so that involved a 30% increase in their first year. Uh, and, and they have a protection uh, now of a union and a collective agreement. Um, looking forward, I'll, I'll just keep my comments um, uh, really brief. I am afraid, I'm afraid of what's gonna happen. So although a lot of our members have actually 
benefited from um, the increased funding and stimulus funding uh, and CERB uh, that has come um, uh, during the pandemic. I'm afraid about what's going to happen. And we often see that arts are the first uh, the first cuts that governments and conservatives and, and um, business lobbies go after. Um, and so what is this going to mean uh, for artists run culture, uh, artist communities? And I, and I really do believe that's about artists um, forming worker co-ops, joining unions uh, and banding together um, to build systems and structures of mutual aid and solidarity. Um, so again, I, I just want to uh, thank SFU for having us, and and uh, and a kudos to our member Connor Moore for for uh, kicking off this this conversation. Thank you very much, Johnny. Um, I have to say I am personally very excited about the work that uh, the Artists and Cultural Workers Labor Union is doing, and uh, and seeing that there are other uh, that you know you're bringing in new organizations. I was involved with the Pacific Association of Artist Run Centers for years, and the idea of unionizing cultural workers in the artist run center uh, milieu was always kind of this pie in the sky idea. And uh, it's really nice to see that it's being concretized. So congratulations on that. Be happy um, to send you a membership card after, uh, after this. Yeah, <laughs> we'd love that. Um, so we, uh, I'll just remind attendees that uh, you are able to add your questions directed at all or a particular uh, panelist in the Q&A function. So just uh, at the bottom of your screen, you should see the, the, the Q&A uh, little, uh, little icon there and you can add your question there and I'll, I'll read through it um, and pose it to the, to the panelists. But I will use my uh, moderator privilege to ask a question to the panelists. Um, I have several, several questions, but I'll, I'll limit it to one at, at the moment. And I think this will echo many uh, of the ideas that you have shared, um, and thank you for, for that. Um, the, in the uh, arts and uh, cultural production, uh, uh, cultural industry sector, um, there are several different in, I think, uh, competing levels of precarity. Uh, or, or we can see uh, organizations being in competition with artists or various art, you know, different identities within the artist, artist community that seem to be kind of in competition because there is so few resources um, that everybody kind of wants a, a piece of the pie and how that translates um, in my experience and that I've seen is sometimes uh, presenting organizations you know they say we want to pay artists um more you know we'd love to pay them a lot but we just don't have the budget to do that or you know we'd love to show um I don't know this, uh, and, and often that translates through. We'd love to show these, you know, BIPOC creators' work or these emerging artists' work, but um, it's a it's a risk or it's a you know we don't have the built-in audience for it or something like that, right? Um, and at the moment, one of the uh, irony, I guess, of the of the the times is that while some uh, arts organizations have definitely definitely suffered from the um, the COVID-19 pandemic, others are finding themselves in a situation of having a surplus because they didn't do a lot of the programming they were supposed to do um, and because they've been receiving all of this in increased funding or uh, stimulus funding, et cetera, right? So with all of this in mind, like, can we consider this as a moment to rethink those competitions inside the, the cultural uh, sector and and if so like how how do we go about doing that uh kate on okay hi um i love that this is the first question because this was a great part of the conversation that i just came from having with the <laughs> students at humber at humber college in 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 the gta and i've been talking about this for several months in terms of for us to progress, we need to move from a scarcity model um, to an abundance model. Um, scarcity, we ha also have to look at where that sense of scarcity comes from, what drives it, and who benefits from that as well. That it is driven by a very colonial mechanism 
that it is something that it's very capitalistic in nature. And that's not what we are doing as artists, as creatives, as, as members of diverse communities. That what we've seen through the ages in terms of what has preserved our societies over time, it is not competition, but it is collaboration. And what I would love to see is a return to that, that we dig down into it. And this is really what birthed BIPOC TV and film. Um, when Natalie Younglai, who is a writer, writer based here, um, when she saw that almost 10 years ago, in terms of like, wow, there's commonalities in terms of how we are struggling as BIPOC within our sector, that she decided to join with others to bring to bring people together to see what can we do in solidarity to support each other. And from that grew something that's now a Facebook group that's over 2000 people. That's now this grand movement that is shaking things up, that is shifting how we're thinking as a sector as well, that it grew from that, it grew from, some, from a seed, from that seed of community. Um, and that we saw that through the years by sharing our resources, we've been able to build each other up in terms of saying, no, here is this opportunity. Here is how I can help you. Here is how I could share my expertise so we can, so we can grow. Um, and what we also saw is, and then from that, we, this, this is why BIPOC TV and film has been able to exist for all these years. Majority, like prior to my start in January, as a completely volunteer run, community mobilized grassroots organization. It is through the strength of community and collaboration and solidarity. Um, so I think that that's what we really need to challenge where that scarcity, that no, those notions of scarcity is coming from and who, who is benefiting from that. And we will see that it is not us. Um, so that's what I would have to say to that. And for us to think like there is enough. Thank you. And there is. Mm -hmm. So we're working from the assumption that that we have the resources. It's just the way that they are distributed. Um, that, thank you, uh, Johnny. Michael, do you I, have I, a? I response? just want to pick up on that because I, I mean, I completely agree. I think there's a a scarcity mindset within the arts, both in how we as artists and cultural practitioners embody that, um, but also how society values the arts. So I, I, you know, I think there's very, very important critiques that already exist that are quite, um, quite out there in terms of how governments value the arts, how corporations value the arts, and how creative labor is not seen as real work. In the art sector, we also have to, especially in the visual arts sector, have we need to come to a reckoning on how we redistribute resources how that's done equitably, um, how that's done with a redistributive lens. So I'll, I'll, when I was on um, a nonprofit board and got elected for an arts organization that advocates for artists, our one staff person was paid just above minimum wage. Um, and so that organization would drop $2,000 on a printing con uh, a contract overnight without any questions, but the idea of paying that that artist who worked for us a living wage was just outside of the realm of um, of, of possibility, and so we had some real big uh, internal arguments at the board level about what we could afford. And I'm thankful that that artist has since joined a union, um, so that the union can back them up on getting a living wage. So I think we do need to tackle these scarcity mindsets within arts organizations. The resources are there. Um, is just how we're using those effectively. At Value Co-op, we formed uh, as a group of, um, we started with four artists, we grew to eight artists, we then had a conversation about white supremacy, and we doubled our membership to include a majority of IBPOC, Indigenous, Black, and People of Color artists, um, at all levels of the cooperative, and we've actually um, applied an equity mandate to the way work is awarded. So we have redistributive uh, mechanisms within our arts organizations. And, and to Michael's earlier point, um, we compensate our Indigenous, Black, and people of color artists uh, for the emotional labor that they have to do to take um, white artists and white community members through the process of, of learning about white supremacy. 
Um, so there's ways I think we can recenter the individual in collectives, uh, and and these are are things that all arts organizations need to do. Um, and then, then secondly, we need to question these legacy projects. So, you know, the Vancouver Art Gallery, for example, can raise a hundred million dollars to build a really great new cultural institution, but yet um, their, their workers go on strike um, because they can't afford uh, a, a small pay increase to keep up with the cost of living. So we need to cr critique our own institutions um, while also looking at the way governments properly fund and compensate arts and creative labor. Thank you very much, uh, Johnny. And uh, I'll, I'll mention a question that popped up while you were speaking, and I think you addressed it uh, later on in your response, but I'll just mention it so that the other panelists are also able to address. Uh, so uh, Alan Maines asks, what do, does redistribution of resources mean pragmatically? Um, so I'll, I'll I'll mention that and then uh, go to Michael to see if you have uh, something to respond or add to the conversation we've been having. Sorry, I, I opened the Q&A panel and now can make it go away in front of our faces. Um, no, I don't have anything much to add other than um, just saying how smart Johnny and Kadon's <laughs> responses were and I absolutely agree. I would just add you know, to something that I sort of flagged when I was speaking um, and that came up a lot in the conversations is that the scarcity model is not good for the community. You know, it's really damaging. And so um, just to add that to the mix, it's actually, it, it's actually toxic inside of the, inside of the community. Yeah. Thank um, you. And now are, are we supposed to answer that? <laughs> Yeah, the question. Well, just the, the, the practically what does redistribution of resources mean? Uh, Kay Dawn, you, you, you did touch on that in your response. So maybe yeah. if you want to specify a little bit. Yeah, I could speak to that. So we have to look at how funding, um, and I'm speaking mainly right now from in terms of funding perspective, um, that funding in the film and TV industry, we have to look at how that has been di distributed um, historically who has benefited the most from it and apply, apply an equity lens now to the changes that must be made. And I love using, <laughs> I'm very illustrative. So I wish I had like a whiteboard and could draw it out and everything. Um, there is, there's a move, a lot of talk about parity. So that's like a fifth, usually like a 50, 50 split when we talk about equality and so on. But if for if for a long if for a long time that a certain group has benefited the most, the solution isn't now to maybe okay wow we're gonna give we're gonna start giving the other groups more they will not you'll still not get a chance to catch up with the people who have been given a lead for so long, and a lot of times without merit, you know that that has been happening for so long. So then we need to now cut back on who has been benefiting from it historically, cut back on that significantly so we could move that around. So then the people who have been marginalized, who have not been able to access that could find, could receive more of it. So I would say like what I've seen yesterday, the Canadian, the Canada Media Fund announces some changes to how they're doing their funding in terms of their programs for 2021, 2022. And one of the things that they're doing now in terms of prioritizing organization um, production companies that are 51% BIPOC owned. Um, so now you'll see that those companies will receive more of, will receive more of the funding that's available. Mm -hmm. Also creating particular stream and streams and putting more money into it so that members of relate, ra racialized communities could receive more out of the pot. So now we're thinking, so if for example, it's been a hundred million dollars that's been distributed. Okay, and we see that there's a sp specific group that's received 75% of that for a long period of time. Now we're gonna cut back and that particular group may only receive 25% of the funding. And that 75% would then be distributed amongst those who have been marginalized. <laughs> so that's what I mean in terms of a very pragmatic sense that we're just shifting where the dollars are going now. Um, mm -hmm. just to correct a lot of the historical wrongs and inequities in Canada. That, that'll require a mentality shift also for those it, who used to receive is, the 75. 
percent, right? It it is, and that's what we're seeing. That's very challenging now yeah. in terms of those who are so used to benefiting from these systems are now struggling to understand like what's happening now. And then we mm -hmm. see sometimes in the responses a sense of entitlement to that funding, to those resources, you know. Um, and I think at a time individually have to think, why do I feel entitled to that? Mm -hmm. Why do mm -hmm. I feel like I deserve that more than others? You know, to have that um, reckoning, reckoning with self about it. Um, but this is how we're going to correct it. And I love that Canada Media Fund is taking such a strong stance yeah. around that. Yeah, that, that is very strong. Uh, specifically, I mean, in relation to the Canada Council's stance, for example, which is, which is there, but it's much softer. Uh, so we have another question from Alan Mains. Uh, and I think this might kind of uh, follow nicely. Uh, with respect to monetary compensation, who defines who is an artist uh, and where do the funds come from? Uh, did they come from government? So in essence, taxpayers uh, or elsewhere? I'm, I'm happy to, to jump in on that one because I think, you know, these narrow definitions of what artistic practice is um, as defined by governments uh, uh, can be very limiting. So in Value Co-op, we have a very broad view of what arts and cultural practice is. Um, and, and our Indigenous and Black and, and, and racial artists have actually really done a lot of work um, within value to talk about how their forms of historical and contemporary artistic practice are not valued by governments, by arts organizations and funding bodies. So, you know, we really need to dismantle systems of funding um, and, and take that, that those resources and allow uh, communities, racialized communities to um, set their own funding mechanisms and, and systems of support. And, and I completely agree with Kate on those resources need to be disproportionately put into communities that have suffered um, historical and ongoing uh, systems of violence uh, and, and oppression. We also look within the art sector of how jobs are awarded uh, uh, based on who you know and so who has mm -hmm. access to those relationships to to those uh influencers um and and the folks who can make decisions based on work um and 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 uh funding um i i you know i i really push back on this idea that like um uh you know it's it's seen as a cost um funds from government through taxpayers i i really um, I, I, I really reject that premise because I think when we live in a society and community, um, we, we pool our resources together. And, and, and as we've seen with, with, um, with the pandemic, uh, cultural production has been so important to create communities together. Uh, and I know I wouldn't have survived uh, this pandemic without my Netflix subscription. Um, and, and, and without my arts festivals that I could attend that gave me access to community. So uh, arts practice and cultural practice is not this bonus. It's, it's an essential form of creating community um, and governments. And I, and I believe governments through the tax system um, should be funding and prioritizing this. Um, so it pulls artists out of um, this mentality, the scarcity mentality of chasing that dollar, chasing that sponsorship. Um, we need a very healthy uh, funded um, artistic system to have a really rich um, and vibrant society. Thank you. Um, does any of the other panelists want to add or respond? No, um, I would just say just to echo Johnny that it's very true in terms of um, when we look at some of the eligibility criteria for funding, um, how like it is very, de um, very dependent on who your network is. And as I said, like in terms of who you have access to, one of the revolutionary thing that the Canada Media Fund is doing for one of their funding streams for racialized communities is that you do not need to have, um, you do not necessarily have to have a broadcast license. Mm -hmm. um, you don't need to have that trigger. Uh, and that is huge because we're thinking about who has access to that, you know, and what that is going to do for, for creatives from racialized communities um, and stripping away some of these barriers that have been there for so long that have only benefited a few, 
um, <laughs> when we look at who has who has access to the capital to to do feature to do feature film to create in that way to have the creative freedom where you could have a slate of projects at one time you know um, that we have to consider that as well in terms of even getting a credit on a project mm -hmm. you know so then you could access future opportunities you know what that looks like so yeah it's um in terms of defining who who or what an artist is um I don't want to get into the weeds on that, but in terms of who has access to funding and who is determining what those what the eligibility criteria is, even who is determining what is Canadian content and what is not Canadian content, um, that we really need to challenge those notions as well. So I, I will live in that area. Is that mm -hmm. Thank you. Michael, mm -hmm. do you want to add? Yeah, I'd love to add. I, I totally agree. I mean, I think this this idea of being able to be assessed, you know, thinking about how our funding systems work, but being able to be discussed and assessed um, as per your own context, as opposed to some kind of uh, made up standard of, uh, of evaluation feels like a really exciting way. I mean, I think, I think funding bodies are recognizing this and maybe making tiny little baby steps to move towards that. But I think a reimagining of that whole system about how people are assessed and discussed and um, how, uh, how that could be um, dictated by how they articulate their own context mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to some dominant context that we're talking about and discussing, mm -hmm. absolutely. Well, the question of uh, what constitutes artistic excellence, right, uh, has to be rethought in that way, and uh, and definitely, you know, with the the, the Canadian content model, I mean th that that model has been instrumentalized for for a long time and, and really geared towards uh, commodification of of cultural products, um, and what it means, what Canadian content means is 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 pretty empty shell, right, at this point. Um, I'll, I'll read another question that, that I think addresses some of these ideas of, of the economic um, uh, instrumentalization of, of arts and culture, uh, unfortunately. So Stephen Crozier says, I've heard that in Ireland, the arts are prioritized in economic recovery. Might it be fruitful to contact someone in government there? I would expect that a ministry supporting the arts there um, would be a somewhere to go, I guess. Uh, also viewed from economic and environmental perspectives, the artistic endeavors are very productive with low economic impact. Uh, yes, and that's certainly an argument that governments use to justify funding to the cultural sector, uh, but that doesn't necessarily change the valuing uh, that is posed on it. So I'll, I'll, I'll open it up to the uh, panelists. So I Ireland's a really good but bad example of how to fund and prioritize the arts because embedded in their models is this idea of a business economic driver. So they have some interesting programs around how artists can apply for EI to launch their practice and take time off from paid work. Um, so I think there's threads of um, of examples internationally um, uh, that we should be looking at in terms of a, a post-pandemic recovery. But, but there's some real um, uh, problematic approaches that arts activity and, and sometimes the best cultural activity is not defined by the economic impact it has. So the, the works that have changed society, whether they've been in film, theater, or the visual arts, didn't have a marketable um, economic impact at that time. So some of those books that, that have really changed society um, didn't sell when they were first written. And so if we tie um, artistic production to just the economic uh, output, we're, we're just embedding further embedding capitalist modes of production. And I think that really needs to be challenged. Um, there's also examples like when the Great Depression hit uh, in, in the United States, um, they put thousands of artists in unemployed work programs, but those work programs were tied to output, whether it was painting murals and, and sculptures. And I think we we, um, when we, we start to peel apart the, the government motives and the state motives of these types of funding programs, we can look at um, some more sinister impacts around 
putting up murals that celebrate the state or capitalism. Uh, I think Michael uh, hinted at a much better form of program around the CERB and a universal basic income that allows artists the freedom to think, um, to write, and to create that's not tied to a deliverable project, whether it's to the state or the funder. So yes, let's look internationally, but we have those solutions at home already. And it just comes down to a matter of priorities uh, and where that funding is going. And I think if we put that funding into individuals and communities and uh, not controlled by state or, or nonprofit industrial complex programs, we're going to have better artistic and creative communities um, and products and work come out of that. Uh, Kaydon and uh, Michael, you were nodding. Do you want to uh, to add? All right. Just so let's agree, move on. Agree, agree. Just agree. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Uh, so moving on, I think the next question follows very nicely, actually. So uh, Ryan McCormick, your thoughts on the supply of artists versus the demand for art, and if enough resources could be found to pay all artists a living wage, would everyone want to become an artist? Uh, big question mark there. Uh, maybe we'll go to, to Michael because you addressed the, the, the universal income in your presentation. Sorry, I did it again. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think in my conversations with my colleagues, um, I remember at the beginning of the pandemic uh, when CERB first arrived, um, there were lots of conversations around uh, the relief it kind of supplied. It, 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 it just alleviated a tension that we didn't know had existed because we had been working so hard for so long in a certain model. And I think when the when CERB came around, it was a huge revelation of what the potential of a program like this, of a universal basic income for artists could provide. Um, and so I think, you know, I think it's a really fruitful discussion to have. I don't know the, the huge mechanisms that sort of need to move and, and look at that model and, and how it could be put in place, but I think it's really a worthy discussion to have and would contribute to how artists feel in the society. You know, there, so, something in, inside of that question is asking like, what are we always asked to do? Funding, you know, even the funding that was announced most recently, I think everybody's looking ahead and they're, the structures are, are thinking, what is gonna get us back on our feet? We are actually gonna need art. We're gonna need art to move us out of this pandemic and create hope again and create a future, you know, uh, and there's a huge potential in this moment right now to change the way we do things. So I think a, anything that, that says to artists, you have worth and you have value inside of the machine of society, as one of my colleagues said, I think is, is gonna be super impactful. Thank you. Um, Johnny or Arcadon? Well, I mean, like, I, I think there's, again, like we're talking about scarcity mindsets and, and I believe everyone deserves a living wage, not just artists. So um, I, I think we can, we're talking about the arts community, but we collectively have the ability to fund these types of programs. And this again, comes down to priorities. So like last year, the, the Canada's top billionaires grew their wealth by $53 billion. It's like an increase of 28% uh, in, in how much those that small group of billionaires have. And that's through economic stimulus funding. That's through um, other, you know, uh, people moving to home um, so the money's out there, it just comes down to priority. So we can afford to give all artists a living wage. And actually, I would argue, we can afford to give all, uh, all residents within Canada a living wage. And so these types of universal income um, programs will particularly help the arts um, and fuel creative practice, but there's no reason why this can't exist across uh, all of society. The resources are there, just comes down to priorities. Thank you. Uh, Kaydon, do you want to add something? No, I'm just saying um, I would, I wish everybody could want to, wants to be an artist then, you know, that would be amazing. <laughs> you know, think about the world that we'll, that we'll live in. And um, I think creativity is also universal. 
Um, but the other two answered it beautifully. So I'll leave it there. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, we and, and, and we are, you know, have been living for uh, decades within a neoliberal framework that has dictated a lot of how we understand these policies. But uh, it's not to say that it couldn't be uh, otherwise, right, where um, those things don't have to be quite as instrumental and uh, cultural value producing cultural value producing artistic value can be uh, an ends in and of itself, uh, not only a means to an economic ends. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I just want to pick up on that because I think about like all of the like the the value that is lost and 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 you know if we're going to put this in economic terms the economic impacts that that's lost um, when we don't provide opportunity for artists so i'm going to um, use a concrete example from a story of one of our members who freely shares this and that's Gigi she's a paris fashion trained instructor um, expert sewer who uh, who could not make a living as an artist so she was cleaning um, buildings in vancouver uh, for minimum wage, and and she's been trained in Paris and with a master tailor in San Francisco. And um, when she the pandemic hit and she was laid off from her job, she started selling masks out of her closet um, uh, in East Vancouver to pay for her medication costs. Um, and and she has since joined our our value co-op. We actually have created a spin-off co-op um, that is a sibling co-op that has a group of thir about thirty. Um, primarily women who are working from home making incredible, incredible um, uh, pieces of garments, um, masks and tote bags and, and, um, and, and uh, clothing. Um, and all of these incredibly talented um, artists, artisans uh, were not valued before the pandemic. And many of them have lost their jobs because they were working in the costume industry. Um, and so that's economic in, uh, output. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with cleaning buildings. I think um, our, our cleaning staff and our sanitization staff deserve some of the highest wages in society because we know how important their work is um, uh, to keeping us all safe and healthy. But when we, we narrowly focus that this is just about the arts, we're missing that these are people who, who could be creating domestic manufacturing, could be creating domestic production um, that, that are living wage jobs that we can afford to pay benefits. Again, it comes down to priorities um, and where the state, where government is putting resources in. Um, and, and I think, you know, when we, we connect with people like Gigi uh, uh, who can do incredible work, we should be supporting them um, with funding uh, and, and, and bringing that work um, and collectivizing that work uh, here at home. Thank you, Johnny. I see that Kendra has joined us. We have a minute left to the panel. So I might just open it up for final comments from the panelists. I just want to say thank you to both Kaydan and Johnny for the work that you do. It was so great to hear more about what you do and to hear you speak so inspiringly and eloquently. Um, so thank you for what you do. And I will just echo those thank yous uh, to all three of our panelists and to Marianne for an incredibly productive, provocative and eloquent set of comments. I think finishing um, on Johnny's comments about um, the sort of general value of artistic work in society and the way we need to connect it more explicitly to other forms of value production um, is a really great place to finish. And I would just say that we are actually hoping to have um, in June a webinar on uh, basic income as the last webinar in our series um, for this uh, academic year as it is at SFU. Um, so it's a topic we hope to return to and the idea that as a society uh, we do have the resources uh, to pay everyone um, a living income and provide uh, the necessities of life that people need including housing food and the right to as Maiko said um, an imagination <laughs> so thanks again to everyone um, thanks again especially to the panelists um, and that wraps things up for today thank you thank you